presence of the Lord here and uh, just so appreciate his presence here. And uh, anyway, I just want to get started. We're, we're in a series right now of asking the question, what really is church? Because I think, honestly, I think so much of what we have seen uh, the church be or what we think of the church is so far from God's original intention. It's so far from God's ultimate intention. It's so far from God's eternal purpose. And let's start with um, Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul in Ephesians is, is unveiling the eternal purpose of God in Ephesians chapter 1. And we, we looked at this last, last Sunday, but we'll look at this again. But in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is unveiling the eternal plan and purpose of God, the, the plan that he established before time and creation in his eternal counsels. And he said in uh, Ephesians 1 verse 22, and he put all things in subjection to his feet. And he gave him, he gave Christ as head over all things to the church. Sadly, Jesus Christ is not head of most of what is called the church today. May he, may he truly be the head of this church. May he truly, before he returns, be the head of his church once again, which is his body. And we talked about this last, last week. You are the body of Christ. And, in, and we looked at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul said, the body of Christ is is Christ. Now that doesn't mean we're little Christ or little gods or any of that, but what it means is we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And when we come together, we are the, literally the body of Christ on the earth. It is an incredible, profound revelation. We are literally the, uh, the, the body of Christ expressing his life in the earth. And I think so many people have gotten bored with church because men have turned church into an organization or an institution or a two-hour service instead of realizing, no, we are the living body of Christ, literally Christ on the earth expressing his life. And when you really get the, the revelation of what we're, and this is what we talked about last Sunday, when you get the revelation of this, it brings a revolution and I said, we need this to be, rev I said, revelationary, where it's revelation that brings a revolution. That if we could understand the eternal purpose of God, that, that God's purpose from now until forever, <laughs> into the eternal ages, we will forever be the body of Christ, expressing the life of Christ to the earth, to the universe, for all the endless ages to come. Yet it begins now in the church age. It begins now in the church age of this body filling uh, the, the earth, filling the earth with his very life. And so Paul says, you are his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. How desperately we need in this day and hour when everything around us is being shaken and everything around us it's just gone insane. How desperately we need, once again, the fullness of Jesus Christ. It's the, the church is, his, is, is, he says here, he fills all in all. Christ in all. Only those who have Christ in them belong to the church. Only those who have Christ in them belong to the church. But God does not want us to have just a small measure of Christ. God wants us to have the fullness of Christ. Just, I want us to get a vision of what we can attain to in this life of the fullness of Christ. Sadly, it seems in, in many churches, it's the fullness of, of the soul. It's the fullness of self. And all that we're seeing as things are being shaken is we cannot have mixture. We've got to have Christ in fullness so that we can be what God intends for us to be. Okay, that's where, that's kind of what we looked at um, in, in the last message. I won't go through all that again, but I believe that, that the Lord is bringing a final reformation before he returns. There is going to be a final reformation before the Lord returns. You know, uh, it was an incredible, we had this incredible experience in 2017 
when uh, mom and dad and I went to Germany and we were teaching, it was the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation. We didn't even know all that. We just, someone invited, a friend of ours invited us to speak about God's eternal purpose. And so we were speaking there about God's eternal purpose in Germany, but really it was the 500th year of the Reformation. And what was so interesting was our really good friends uh, from Australia happened to be there at the very same time. And you, you guys know Noel Mann, who was like a spiritual father to this church. Um, he had passed away. And one of his last things he wanted to do, one of the things that he felt like God was calling him to do before he passed away was to do a prayer assignment in Germany for God to bring in the final reformation. And so uh, by d divine coincidence, by divine providence really, is we ended up meeting up with the, the team from his church, Frank Shanahan and his team, who Frank took over from Noel when he passed away. And they were there carrying out that assignment to see the final reformation. We were there teaching about God's eternal purpose. And uh, Frank said, hey, why don't we meet in Mainz, Germany? And we're like, okay, we have no idea anything, what's going on. But we meet in Mainz, Germany. And when we get there, I noticed that there is the uh, Gutenberg Museum there. And I'm like, Oh, wait, we're in the actual city where the Gutenberg printing press was invented, which the Gutenberg printing press was the catalyst for the Reformation. Without the, the printing press, Martin Luther's revelation of justification by faith would have died with him. But, but because of the printing press, it began to spread throughout Europe, through France and Switzerland and Germany, and it brought an incredible reformation of breaking free from the Catholic Church. And here they were praying that the final reformation would come in. Here we were teaching about God's eternal purpose. God brings us providentially into Mainz, Germany, to see them for the first time since Noel passed away. And I remember we were eating there with them, and it was just like, bawling our eyes out. I mean, I, I'd only cry like in Georgia football games or something. I hardly ever cry um, except when Georgia wins, <clears throat> beats Alabama, sorry. Um, just kidding. That's only been once. But anyway, I was so teary-eyed and we were just so teary-eyed and the presence of God had come in so strong and it was like the Lord was just speaking here. The Lord was just speaking here. There is coming a final reformation. See, Martin Luther brought about a reformation that restored the church to justification by faith. But many of the things that were still in the church passed down from Constantine over 1,700 years ago, he did not bring reformation to. And the church, instead of becoming this, being this living, organic expression of the, of the indwelling life of Christ, has become an organization, has become an institution. And I believe this final reformation is going to bring, and there are many things to it, but one thing it's going to do is bring the church back to God's original intention for what the church is meant to be. And, I, and just, I was reminded of this, this story that this is what God is doing. Um, this past week, I listened to two different people say the same thing, that God, before the Lord returns, he is going to bring down organized institutional uh, Christianity, the institutional church. God is going to bring this down. I heard another, another person talking about it, and he said the very same thing, and it just quickened something in me, like, yes, this is what God is moving us towards, is God, before the Lord returns, a final reformation is going to take place. One of the hallmarks of this Reformation will be the end of organized Christianity and the institutional church and a rebirth of, of church as God always intended it to be. All the way back in his eternal counsels, a corporate expression of Christ indwelling life through his interdependent body on the earth. How we need to recover this. How we need to recover what God always intended. Now, if we are going to have what God wants, I mean, how many of you are sick of organized Christianity anyway? It's just a bunch of government of man and all that nonsense. Is we need Christ. We need Christ in fullness. We need for God to have what he wants. And this message, if we're going to get to that place, the understanding of church as we know it must be deconstructed or actually taken a sledgehammer to and demolished because we all carry into, the, into our minds 
a concept of church and what we think church is that's not really biblical, but it's more passed down from Constantine over 1,700 years ago when he legalized Christianity. And through the years, we have just accepted an idea of church that's not really what Scripture teaches. That we just, that church, all church is, is a one to two hour meeting where you go to once a week and then you go home and live your life. No, that's not church. The church is the body of Jesus Christ, those who have his life and those who express his life together. So that's where we're going here in this message. And the, the one thing about this, I was thinking about this preparing for this message. The one thing about this is when COVID hit in 2020, I believe, and we had, we had been hearing uh, different people say this, that God was bringing down the church. God was bringing down the organized institutional church. And then COVID hits, we were hearing that before that, before it hit, COVID hits, and then church as we know it ends. You know, it's like everything goes online. And, you know, yes, there was definitely sinister evil plans by evil governmental leaders. There's no doubt about it. But I believe sovereignly God was allowing this to say, hey, listen, I'm doing something in the church. I'm trying to break down what you've come to know as church. Sadly, most leaders rebuilt the same thing they were doing before COVID, only bigger and better. And we missed what God was trying to say of what the church is meant to be. It's not to be this place you go one to two hours on Sunday. You're meant to be the very body of Christ who gathers together under the headship of Jesus Christ to express his indwelling life together. Now, as we'll get to in this message, the only reason that works for leaders who want to build that organized, institutionalized Christianity is because there are consumers for it. And so if we are going to get what God wants as a church that expresses his life, we've got to lay the sledgehammer, so to speak, to what some have called consumer Christianity, where we go to church to get, we go to church to receive instead of going to church to serve and to, get, and to give. You see, there's a mindset change we need to have. Are you with me so far? Okay, so I want to show this quote here. Um, so Ben, if you're paying attention, awesome, see your thumb there, awesome, okay. The American church is made for those who want to fit Jesus into their life. The New Testament church is made for those who want Jesus to be their life. That, that really is what we see in America is so much of what we see in America is made, tailor-made for those who want to fit Jesus into their life. Okay, Lord, you can have this much. You can have these two hours or three hours on Sunday, but I'm going to live my life. That's the American church. And so we've developed these seeker-sensitive, attractional models that try to bring people in who are unchurched. So they come and they experience this environment and they... They love it and they want to invite their friends back. And yet, that's just made for those who want, to fit, who want to try to fit Jesus into their life. The New Testament church is for those who want Jesus to be their life. And that's the only model we need to come back to is, is this model of what church is meant to be for those who want Jesus to be their life, which really, that's the, the gospel. That is New Testament Christianity. There is no such thing in the scriptures as I'm going to fit Jesus into my life. I'm going to fit him into my schedule. I'm going to fit him into my priorities. No, when you come and you lay your, and you accept Christ into your life, you're giving him your life and he's coming to take over. He's not coming to fit in. I think he's under the impression he's king and he's Lord for some reason, for obvious reasons, because he is. But he's coming into your life not just to fit in to your schedule and your time and your priorities. He's coming in to take over as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He is head of the church. This is the only way New Testament church works. Okay, another quote here is T. Austin Sparks is the first person to use, the first person I've heard to use, who, who was alive, who, I think he died in 1973, but he really ministered during the Second World War in England. He was the first person to mention organic, organic to describe what the New Testament church is meant to be. 
So he says this, God's way and law of fullness is that of organic life. In the divine order, life produces its own organism. Whether it be a vegetable, animal, human, or spiritual, this means everything comes from the inside. Okay, catch that. The Church of America wants to build everything from the outside in. The organic church comes from the inside out, from the indwelling life of Christ, from those who have the indwelling life of Christ who come together as an interdependent body to be fit together to express his life in the earth. It comes from the inside. Function, order, and fruit issue from this law of life within. It was solely on this principle that we have in the New Testament what came into being. Organized Christianity has entirely reversed this order. See, God, I believe there's a jealousy in the heart of God to get what he always intended. And if we can, and I mentioned last Sunday that there is, pres there is presently a, de a de churching in America where over 40 million Americans have left the church over the last 20 to 30 years. That's, uh, as I mentioned last Sunday, that's 1.25 times greater in the opposite direction of the first great awakening, the second great awakening, awakening, and all of Billy Graham's crusades put together, but in the opposite direction. We're definitely living in the time of the great falling away, but I think also one of the reasons why is because of what church has become as a place you go to and instead of seeing it as a, what has always intended to be, a living expression of the body of Christ expressing his life together in unity and love um, and order and so that he could have what he wants. And so we, I believe there is a jealousy in the heart of God to get us back to his ultimate intention, to get us back to his blueprint, not our blueprint, not his kingdom, not our kingdom, what God wants, not what we want. See, church in the New Testament is, is vastly different than what most think. What flows out of life is organic, natural, spontaneous, and free. Structures, processes, services become the natural expression and overflow from those who are living by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So this is really what God's after. This is what God wants to get. Now, if you, if you look up the word church in the, in the Greek, the word church is the word ekklesia. And this word ekklesia is, comes from the word ek, which means out of, and it comes from the word klesis, means calling. Ekklesia means a, a calling out. It's a calling out. It is a a body of, it's used as a body of citizens gathered together to discuss the state of affairs. It was used in the, uh, in, in the Old Testament talk to talk about Israel being gathered together. But the whole thing of what church is, it is a calling out of those who have been called out in Jesus Christ to come together corporately under the headship of Jesus Christ where he's truly head and what he wants to do it happens. It's not just something we're going to come up with our good ideas and ask God to bless it. We're saying, Lord, what is the head directing for this service? We're taking our directions from the head. We're not taking our directions from what seems like the best way to grow our church or the best way to meet felt needs. It's like, no, Lord, what is the head speaking? Because the head gives direction to the body who carries out and executes the commands that come from the head. I think God's through with this idea of like, this is a good idea. Lord, will you bless it? It's like what Terry Bennett says is what the Lord did not initiate, he does not appreciate. God does not appreciate our good ideas. He loves you, but he doesn't appreciate our good ideas. He wants what comes from him. He wants it to spring forth from him. And so, anyway, the ecclesia is, is, is the is what the called out ones who gather together. Now, there is a, obviously a universal reality of this, the universal global body of Christ. There is a local expression in a given city or community. But it's those who come together under the headship of Jesus Christ to say, Lord, what are you saying to the church? Because, what, you know, the Lord has a plan and an agenda for every service. And I, I was so thankful for Shelley 
She may have been the only, I'm not, I'm not, she probably wasn't the only one, but she listened last Sunday and, and asked the Lord, okay, Lord, what are you saying for this Sunday? And she, God, God, the Lord gave her Psalm 20. See, we want to ask the Lord, Lord, what are you doing this Sunday? Lord, what are you saying when we gather? And we want to come like 1 Corinthians 14, 26, when you gather, each one has a word, a psalm, a hymn, a teaching, or a revelation, or a tongue. And we're all coming to church just like we would to a, a cookout. We're coming and we're bringing something to church, something to give someone, something to give the body, something to bless someone individually. We're not just coming to be a spectator who listens. We're coming to be a participator who gives, who contributes, who blesses. That's the body. That's what church is meant to be. But the, the problem that we have is we have been, th this idea that has been so ingrained into Western Christianity and so ingrained into our culture, no matter how hard we try, we all of us, me included, we have a concept of church that is not what God really wants. We have a concept of church being a place we go to sit and listen to a message for two hours, or, or not, not, not two hours, I haven't gotten there that long. We, we go to sit to listen to music and a message for one to two hours. But we, we have this concept of what the church is meant to be, and it's to some degree in all of us, and me included, we've developed a consumer mentality and we say, okay, well, the message was pretty good today. I'll give it a three star. But the music, uh, that was even better. I'll give it five stars. And yes, we almost approach church as if we're consumers giving five star ratings to what just took place instead of saying, no, we are the body coming together on the, under the headship of Jesus Christ to express his life together. Sometimes... When God wants to build and to plant that which is of the Spirit of God, it, there must be deconstruction. See, Jeremiah 1.10 says, talking about Jeremiah's prophetic ministry, the Lord told Jeremiah, See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow. Well, that sounds pretty negative, doesn't it? And then God says, I'm moving you to this place to build and to plant. God isn't just wanting to destroy organized institutional Christianity and the church as we've come to know it just for his, because he's in a bad mood or something. God has a blueprint and he wants what he established as his blueprint in the eternal councils to be worked out into time and creation before the Lord returns. So I believe we are living in the time period right now where judgment has begun in the house of God. Judgment has begun in the house of God. Before judgment comes to the earth and it is going to come, the day of the Lord is coming. I don't know when, but the, the day of the Lord is coming and there will be judgment for the earth. But before that judgment comes to the earth, there is judgment in the house of God. We are living in that moment right now. We are living in that moment right now. Now, that should not be something we look at and point the finger and say, okay, well, look at them, look what they're doing, and you know, judgment, judgmentally and critically examining them. And No, God wants us to look here. God wants us to look in our own heart for our own hearts to be exposed and our own ways and our own thinking patterns and our own mentality to be revealed so that we can evaluate ourselves and say, Lord, what is it in me? What is it in me that needs to change? So we often look and say, no, that needs to change. No, what's it in me that needs to change? But there is clearly, we are clearly living in an hour where judgment has begun in the house of God. And I've, you know... Over, the, over whatever my life as a, as a Christian for the past 30 years, I don't think I can recall any time where I've seen judgment coming to the house of God quite like it's coming right now. God is bringing exposure to the church. God is bringing light and exposing in the church. And I don't believe we're even halfway finished. I believe there's so much more that's going to be uncovered. And it's not, it, it's one of those times where we got to just say in the fear of the Lord, Lord, what is it in me that needs to change? What do I need to do differently? How do I need to think differently? 
But, you know, just th there's so many things we could talk about in terms of Constantine and how he brought, it, brought a change of the, of the church in this, you know, over 1,700 years ago, how it was recovered during the Reformation. And, you know, there's so many things we could say. I'm just going to make it real simple here and just, just put this quote up here. Uh, Richard Halverson said, this is a great quote. He said, when the Greeks got the gospel, they turned it into a philosophy. When the Romans got it, they turned it into a government. When the Europeans got it, they turned it into a culture. And when Americans got it, they turned it into a business. I mean, haven't, hasn't America, the American church become a business where the pastor is the CEO? I'm not talking about our church. We're, we're, I'm definitely not the CEO. I promise you that. But I'm talking about out there and, and building their own kingdoms and their own empires where the pastor is the CEO, that the church has become a business and we're responding to consumers. Now, you know, speaking here locally, I'm sure we're not like that, but there's still that tinge of consumerism that has affected our minds that we think, okay, we go to church to, to get. We go to church to receive instead of going to church to give, instead of going to church to serve. You know, we, we come to church like we're going to a sporting event or a movie. We're saying, okay, I'm going, to I'm going to spectate and watch this movie, this event, instead of seeking the Lord and asking him, okay, what are you saying? What do you want to, to, to say today? Now, just want to just, again, show some more slides here. Just, just to kind of contrast here, consumer Christianity versus the body of Christ as revealed in Scripture. Okay, consumer Christianity views church as a place you go on Sunday. When you have a revelation of the body of Christ, it views church as a people who gather regularly under the headship of Jesus Christ where we wait on him and we learn to express his indwelling life together. A consumer mentality comes and says we're passive spectators who come to listen and be spiritually entertained by a quality one to two hour service with an emotionally stirring music, an uplifting, relevant, practical message. Whereas the body of Christ says, no, I'm coming as an active participator. I've taken ownership and responsibility for each gathering and are using my gifts and talents to contribute to the growth of the body. The consumer, said, the consumer doesn't really think about the Sunday gathering until they're 15 minutes into worship. They're like, oh yeah, I'm actually at church right now. The body of Christ, when, we're, when we have the right paradigm and perspective and we say we're an interdependent function who is learning to function together as the body, we seek the Lord throughout the week for a word, a song, a scripture, or another expression of Christ's indwelling life that will help build up the body. A consumer says, I depend on the pastor and the worship team to experience God Whereas when you are a member of the body, when, you're, when you understand your role as a body, is you are equipped to experience God independently, but you also realize your dependence on the entire body for life and growth. Okay, so how do you know if you still have a consumer Christianity mentality. How do you know if I'm, I'm a consumer Christian? There's four signs that I want to point out to you if, how to tell if you're still a consumer Christian. Number one is you decide where to go to church and you decide when to leave a church. See, 1 Corinthians, let me, let me just say that one more time. Number one is you decide where to go to church, and you decide when to leave a church. Now, I want us to think about, let's, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, and I want us to see this, I want us to see this scripture, and, and just to think about the scripture, this has been highlighted to me recently, where Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, about how the body is meant to function and how the body is meant to express 
the life of Christ together through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul said that, uh, Paul said, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. See, when Jesus Christ is your Lord and the church is his body, we don't really, I mean, yeah, the Lord is, the Lord does ask, you know, the Lord is interested in, in who we are and our preferences and things like that, but he's more interested in, okay, I am Lord, you're not. I am Lord and you're not. I place you in the body just as I desire. If he's really Lord, we, you know, we, obviously we can say, okay, Lord, I don't really like this place or that, that, this idea or whatever, but it's his choice, not ours. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. It, where we go to church and when we, leave, we, when we leave a church is a lordship issue. It, it, it's not just something like, okay, what, what do we like? You know, what do we like? What, what is it we want? And it's more like, Lord, what do you want? Where do you want to place me? And if something goes wrong, we don't just say, okay, it's time for me to head out of here. Why? Is the Lord leading you out? No, something happened and now I'm leaving. No, that is a lordship. And what I'm getting at is it's a lordship issue here. I don't know if you've seen uh, the comedian John Christ. He did a um, uh, some couple videos called Church Hunters. I don't know if you've seen those. those are, I got the link in the notes here. You can watch two of them. They're really, they're really, really funny. But he, he really puts out what consumer Christianity has become in America. It's this young couple, and they're, it's almost like they're, it's a parody of the house hunters, and they got, almost got like this real estate agent, and they're going to the real estate agent. The real estate agent's taking them around to all these big mega churches, and he's saying, okay, well, this church offers a, a coffee bar with 60 flavors, and this church has a youth, youth group with this many people, or this, this pastor only preaches for 30 minutes, or this, wor this church has this incredible worship team with, you know, light, this kind of lights, and, and they're going like, yeah, well, um, I don't really like the coffee bar because I don't drink coffee, but I love the youth group, or, you know, I, I rather prefer a 60-minute message as opposed to a 30-minute TED Talk, and, you know, they're just kind of talking about, like, just like they're shopping for a house, and it really does capture what, what the American church has become as a consumer Christianity to go like, we're, it's like you're shopping for a house. When the Lord, when he's Lord, he says, I place you in the body just as I desire. It's a lordship issue. Okay, y'all got quiet. If Jesus is Lord and it's his body, He's the one that decides where to place you, not yourself. I mean, obviously, God does care what you think, but it's, it's something like, I, you know, I believe that, that fi like finding the place God would have you to be as a member in the body of Christ is one of the most important decisions you make. Who you marry, your children, your career, those are all, you know, your ministry, those are all very important. But we kind of just think, okay, where you go to church, it doesn't really matter. No, it matters greatly. Oh, it doesn't really matter if you're in a consumer mentality because you can just go what suits you best. What, but it, when you get the right paradigm and perspective of what the church has always been intended to be, you're like, Lord, okay, what part of the body do you want to place me in? See what I'm saying? See the difference in mentality? Okay, I need to move on or y'all are going to tell me to stop. Okay, number two is you depend upon a leader for spiritual growth. You depend upon a leader for spiritual growth. Okay, every pastor at one time or another has heard the complaint, I'm not being fed here anymore. I'm not growing here anymore. Okay, nowhere in Scripture are, are you instructed to be solely dependent upon a spiritual leader in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, God does put leadership in place, Ephesians 5, or no, Ephesians 4, for the fivefold ministry to bring forth a mature man. So leaders, leaders do have a role. But so many times we think we're just depending on a leader for spiritual growth instead of going to the Lord himself. 
Instead of going to the Lord himself, we go to a leader and and again, leaders have a role, but ultimately, if we're going to the Lord, if we're going to the Lord, or if we're going to a leader as opposed to the Lord, we're missing what God, what God wants. If you have the Word of God and you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you have everything you need to begin to grow and to grow closer to the Lord and to understand His ways and to begin to bear fruit. You know, but again, leaders are important, but it's not this unhealthy dependence upon a spiritual leader for your own relationship with the Lord. When the Reformation came, one of the things they recovered was the priesthood of every believer. You can go directly to the Lord yourself. You can hear the Lord for yourself. You know, one of the things we've seen as we've done life school over the past 25 or so years is the, one of the most popular classes we teach is learning to hear God's voice and it's, it's really shocking to me how many people, it's probably true here, but it's definitely true in, in Africa, how many of the believers didn't realize they could go directly to God themselves, hear from God for themselves instead of having to go to the man of God to get a word. You don't have to go to the man of God to get a prophetic word. If you've got to always say, okay, you know, I know growing up in a charismatic church, when we first got it moved out of the, the Baptist church into a charismatic expression, I was like, okay, give me a word, give me a word, give me a word. And the Lord's like, finally, you don't need to run here, there, and everywhere to get a word from me. I'm right here in your spirit. Stop running to here, there, and everywhere to get a word and go here where I dwell. You don't have to chase the latest apostle and prophet to hear what God's saying and doing. Now, there is a place for that. I'm not saying there's not a place to go to conferences and to go to different events and things like that. But you go when the Lord leads you, not just this, this church hopper kind of thing. We go here, here, and here to try to hear the latest thing God's doing. When you, when you have the revelation that Christ lives in you and you are a temple, and you can, instead of going there, you can go here to where God dwells in your own spirit and you can commune with him without having to run all over the place, your life changes and you begin to realize, I can hear the voice of God for myself. Because you can. Every single one of you can hear God for yourself. <clears throat> Number three is you don't, if you're a consumer, if you still have a consumer mentality, is you don't take responsibility for the weekly gathering. This is probably a big one for almost everyone in America, probably everyone in around the world, is you don't take responsibility for the weekly gathering. See, how much time, let me ask you, how much time did you spend this week seeking the Lord for this gathering? I won't ask you because I don't want to put you on the spot, but how much time did you spend? Well, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is, it says, when you come, when you gather, each one should have a song, a word, a revelation, an interpret, a tongue, an interpretation. But see, we've so gotten into this spectator mentality, this consumer mentality that we come to church and we don't even think about church until we, you know, we're 15 minutes into worship. We're like, oh yeah, we're actually worshiping the Lord right now. But how much time did you think about this gathering before you came and said, Lord, what are you saying this Sunday? What do you want to say this Sunday? I was thinking about this and I was thinking about David when he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Zion and he had... Um, he, he tried to bring the ark on a new cart and the, the cart began to get wobbly or the ark began to get wobbly and Uzzah touched the ark and he died and all of a sudden David's like, okay, wow. Okay, we need to find out, Lord, what is, how, do we, how do we carry the glory of God? How do we carry the glory of God in the prescribed way? And so David realized the ark of the covenant must be carried on the shoulders of the priest. See, in the new covenant, you and me, we are the priests. It's not just Pastor Brian, and don't ever call me Pastor Brian, but pa quote on Pastor Brian. It's all, not all, all the responsibility doesn't rest on the, me or the elders or on the worship team. 
Every one of us are a priest. Every one of us carry that responsibility to bring the ark into its place. Now, I'm speaking in types and shadows, but you get the point. What I'm saying is that is you think about this, there was one calculation said that this, this Ark of the Covenant, which was overlaid in, or was made of gold and had the, 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 ten, the, the Ten Commandments of stone in it, that one estimate said this Ark weighed between 330 to 615 pounds. Think about that. We just think of like this, this lightweight Ark, but no, it was like, let's just say, let's just say for the simplicity, it's 500 pounds. 500 pounds, and, and four priests would carry this ark on their shoulders, the poles resting on their shoulders. What would happen if one of the priests said, you know, I don't really feel like carrying the ark today. I think I'm just going to watch them carry it design on YouTube and just watch it in my pajamas and drink my coffee. And three of the priests had to carry it. You know, it would be wobbly, and they would not be able to carry it where it needs to be. See, when we understand our priestly responsibility as the, as the body of Christ, that when we come together, we're seeking the Lord. Oh, Lord, what are you saying? What do you want to do? Lord, what are you saying in this season for us? What are you saying for this Sunday corporately together? And we come together, we're bearing the responsibility and the weight for God to do what he wants to do. I mean, isn't that a very different way of thinking about church? <clears throat> is, is this... The ark, carrying the ark was hard work. <laughs> Preparing for church is not, you know, it's, you just show up. No, sometimes it's like, okay, Lord, what are you speaking? Lord, what are you saying as we gather under your headship? See, carrying the ark, it was heavy. It was a burden. See, Lord, when we say, okay, Lord, we assume ownership of our gatherings, and it doesn't just rest on the elders or the worship team, and we say, okay, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing today? And in our house church meetings, Lord, what do you want me to bring? I'm not just going to bring hamburgers. I'm going to bring, Lord, hopefully a scripture or the word of the Lord or a, a song that's going to bless those who are gathered. See, we're, we're, we're called to be the priest of God who bring in the Ark of the Covenant, to shoulder the responsibility Right to show, to take ownership of our responsibility and shoulder the responsibility, so that we can we can bring God's presence into where it needs to be. All right, so that's the priesthood. Y'all are y'all are definitely getting more and more quiet. <clears throat> Thankfully, I'm heading out of town here, so afterwards, so I, I can escape. <clears throat> Number four, the fourth way we know that we are a consumer as opposed to having the right paradigm of the body is when the going gets tough, you get going. <laughs> when the going gets tough, you get going. Well, Peter said that, uh, Peter said, we're, you're a living stone. You're being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Paul said really the same idea in Ephesians. He said, you're being fitted together. You're being fitted together. The sanding and the chiseling and the grinding that comes in a community is so beautiful, though you may hate every second of it, it's necessary for you to be that living stone who's fit together so you can be that, that stone in the body of Christ, that place in the body of Christ. See, sometimes what I think about this, if, if you really want sanctification in your life, get married. I've really, Angie's, or Angie's really provided sanctification to me, but I was already arrived, so she hasn't done much for me. No, I'm kidding. It's actually the other way around, if anyone knows Angie. But if you really want to get, if you really want sanctification in life, get married. If you really, really want it, have children. <laughs> and if you really, 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 really want it, be part of a local community <laughs> of called the church. Because getting involved begins to surface things in our lives that we didn't know were even there. And God uses that to bring sanctification. This idea that we can just sit behind our computers or our iPads and do online church. And I'm thankful for online church and I'm thankful for discipleship online and all those things. Those are beautiful. 
But that's not the church. The church is a local gathering. Now, you can have some measure of it online, but not really what God intends. But when you're living in this church community, the sanding and the chiseling and the grinding that comes from other members is working to fit you as a living stone. And God sovereignly has orchestrated that. God has sovereignly orchestrated the grinding and the sandpaper that is in the church to make you that smooth living stone without rough edges so that you can fit into the, the dwelling place that God is building for his spirit to have habitation. Sometimes we say, okay, Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready as the bride of Christ. Lord, sanctify me. Lord, deal with anything in my heart. Deal with anything that you're working on in me. Deal with me. Lord, make me ready. I want to be the bride who's made ready. The Lord's like, okay, be part of a local church. And when the grinding and the sanding and the chiseling comes, you're like, I'm out of here. And the Lord's like, no, I'm answering your prayer that you prayed for like the last six months in your prayer closet asking me to make you ready. Now I'm putting other living stones and grinding you both together so that you can be this living stone. You're like, I don't like that answer, Lord. Do it another way. Do it differently. And the Lord's like, no, I'm doing it this way. <sighs> For us to experience full sanctification, the Lord must move us from an unhealthy dependence on one another. So we can have an unhealthy dependence on one another. Or we can have an isolated independence from one another into a corporate interdependence. That's the body. So I'll say it again. The Lord, for us to experience full sanctification, I, I just, my conviction, you may disagree, but my conviction is, is the full sanctification God wants to bring into our lives can only happen, uh, not, there's other ways, but one of, the, one of the ways that's very important is in the context of a local church, is for us to experience full sanctification, the Lord must move us from an unhealthy dependence on one another from an isolated independence from one another into a corporate interdependence where we have our own relationship with the Lord, but we are also individual living stones who are fit together. That's beautiful. Don't run from the grinding and the sanding and the chiseling that comes in the local community of the, of the, of the church it's for your good and my good. It's part of the sanctification process, and honestly, I think God enjoys it. <laughs> I think God enjoys looking down on us and seeing us squirm and, like, like you know, get uh, you know, offended over little, small, petty issues. And the Lord's like, ah, look at him. Brian's getting sanctified right now. <laughs> Angie's getting sanctified right now. But it, it really is how God builds his church, prepares his bride, is in the context of the local church to fit you together as a living stone so that you can be part of the house that God is building. But see, if you're isolated and you're independent, if all you're doing, now I'm not speaking to you because you're here, but even those that would listen online, if all you're doing is watching online church and you've listened to every single podcast and every single YouTube video that you could possibly think, I tell you, being part of a local church will sanctify you faster than any of that. You cannot become all that God has intended you to be apart from the local church. It's part of God's method for sanctification. And we're just going to go seek Jesus in my prayer closet, me and Jesus alone in the prayer closet, not being connected to the local church will never come into, and I'm talking even into, into the eternal, eternally, all that God wants. It's in the context of this joining together as a body where we're being rubbed and sanded and chiseled so we can be that living body fit together. <clears throat> I remember, this, this reminds me of um, several years ago, we had our, an old backsplash replaced and we, we got a new backsplash put in 
And we made this horrible mistake as we waited to put under, under cabinet lighting on after the backsplash was finished. Just a Home Depot pro tip and remodeling. If you're planning to have under cabinet lighting, put that in first before you do the backsplash. Because what happened was, once they, they did the backsplash, then they put in the under cabinet lighting, the light then exposed how much the backsplash was not fit together. I mean, it was totally messed up. I mean, it was like completely looked awful. And the light, see what happened is the light exposed where things didn't fit. And thankfully, the, the contractor was gracious enough to come and make those fixes without us having to pay more money. But my point is, is when God begins in, in the local context of the church, when God begins to bring light into us, he's showing us those places where maybe things don't fit. Things are not uh, sanded or chiseled where they need to be. Things haven't been dealt with in our own soul, in our own heart. And those things are not fitting in. And the light exposes those things. And, and it, the thing that we're all tempted to do, including me and I'm the pastor, is I'm out of here. I'm going to go get, it, get a job. And no, I'm, I'm kidding, obviously. <clears throat> but we, we must go through those things God brings into our lives in the context of the local church because that's how the sanctification process happens. <laughs> so instead of saying, I'm just going to run, we say instead, God, do your work in me. And when he does his work of sanding, chiseling, and grinding us with the sandpaper called the church, we then become smooth and we then become, we fit into the corporate expression of what God wants to do and it becomes so beautiful. It becomes so beautiful. And that's what God is wanting to do as he brings us into this corporate expression of the life of Christ. So I just want to just wind this down by by saying a prayer that we've been praying, and we'll, we'll probably just keep praying it for a while, just so we, we really renew our minds about what church is. And so I'm going to end this message with this prayer that we've been praying for a while here, just so we can, we can keep this in the forefront of our minds. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the head of the church. You are the head of this church. Lord, as elders, we surrender to you. And we just say, Lord, have your way. We as your body, your ecclesia, come under your headship together to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to express your life together to love, encourage, and care for one another, and to follow you wherever you go. Thank you, Jesus. Help us here locally to be that church that truly does that in reality. Lord, we also pray for the global church, those as, as you work to bring a final reformation. Lord, we pray that you would work uh, globally, Lord, to bring the church around the world under the headship of Jesus Christ and for the body to make that shift from being consumers to active participators in your body. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us grace as your sandpaper works to sand us and smooth us to fit together into the temple you're building of living stones to be the corporate expression of the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, have your way in the church. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we'll end the online portion here. And... Uh,